We are now in the final stage of the process regarding this uh, economic partnership agreement with Japan. It would be uniting about 600 million consumers um, and one-third of global GDP under a stable and open trade and investment regime. We had already discussions in our committees and uh, all three committees that expressed their views uh, about this agreement expressed themselves in favor of the agreement, meaning the International Trade Committee, the Environment uh, Committee and the Agricultural uh, Committee of the European Parliament. This uh, agreement if ratified by both parties, would be an enormous encouragement to the people who are looking forward to more stable and fair trade relationship in the world. EU and Japan are two big economies of the world, sharing almost one third of the world trade and also one third of the economic power GDP. So the EU-Japan agreement is very much a member of the family of new generation FTAs of the EU. It shares some common aspects with CETA, with EU-Singapore FTA, with EU-Korea, but at the same time it also diverges from them in introducing a new chapter on corporate governance, a dedicated chapter on um, small and medium enterprises, as well as making references to the Paris climate change commitments. For Sweden, um, environmental measures, social standards is very important, but we don't believe that trade deals actually threaten them. And especially if we look at the EU-Japan agreement, there is pretty strong language about, you know, following up on commitments to the Paris Agreement. There is talk about social and labor standards and both parties sign up to not, you know, lower their standards in any way. So I think we can instead see a sort of race to the top where these agreements lead to, you know, pushing the rest of the world to raise their standards instead of, you know, threatening our own standards. In WTO, uh, new rule making has been stagnating. So, for instance, uh, new rules that we need on the investment, competition policy, uh, state-owned enterprises, government procurement, intellectual properties, those things have been left behind uh, in the WTO system. Uh, so now Japan and the EU working together and making those rules uh, you know, stipulated in our bilateral agreement, uh, then perhaps uh, we could promote this kind of rule making in a worldwide context in the WTO in the future. I think that we are not only seeing protectionism now, we're also seeing a kind of tit-for-tat escalation of trade conflict, so that it doesn't necessarily have to come from protectionism. Um, we see it among Swedish companies that are actually forced right now to reorganize a lot of their supply chains, their global value chains, just to sort of avoid being hit one, two, three times by tariffs from the US and China or penalties coming from sanctions towards Russia and Iran. So I think that's why it's even more important that we are able to do progressive, constructive agreements with like-minded partners so that also European businesses kind of have a faith that Europe has got this under control. It is uh, not just um, a trade agreement, but it is an economic, deep economic partnership uh, that also has geopolitical significance in this current climate. And it would be a sort of foothold for the EU and the Asian Pacific market, which is set to grow in the future. We are now faced with another challenge coming from two big economic powers of the world, which tend to take unilateral and nationalistic approach to trading policies. And uh, Japan-EU economic partnership agreement would show a model to the world and model to two big economies that multilateral approach to trade system is the workable, most welcome policy of any big economies. So to those MEPs that are questioning this agreement, I would say think about all the good things that are going to come to their own community and think about what policies they can implement in their own country to help some of those uh, potential losses.